May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The comic book caricature of the clergyman is he is always uttering platitudes. And so here's a platitude for you. We are all different. There are the usual marks of differentiation between us. We are white and black or Asian. We speak a different language as a mother tongue. We speak English, French, Spanish, Urdu, uh, Italian. Difference is a word that sometimes has negative connotations. Ah yes, you've met Xenia, our intern. She's different. And the root dis has to do with the fact that she might not be like the rest of us. There is something that Roger is not. While the entire group of campers are doing the happy chicken dance in the hall, Roger is sitting alone in the corner on a chair. Diversity is the preferable word. That's the one that gets the stamp of approval these days. We would take a certain amount of pride in the fact that our community is diverse, that we don't all need to be the same, that Horim and Xenia and Andrew and Enoch can be part of the same congregation and part of the same fabric. Our parish church is diverse. Our company's board of directors may have a commitment to diversity. We take pride in being a mosaic, in Canadian mythology, the Americans always had a melting pot whereby everybody was sort of melted down to be an American. And that Canada had a mosaic. And we talked about the Canadian mosaic. I remember that from my first year political science class. And there you had the, the Icelanders north of Lake Winnipeg. And you had the Hungarians and the Ukrainians in the prairies. And you had the Italians in Toronto. And you had the French Canadians in Quebec. And you had the Dutch in British Columbia. And we sort of, and that wonderful advertisement with all the people on the hillside, I'd like to buy the world a Coke, where you have all of these diverse people. We said yes as a country were like that. It makes it difficult sometimes to be a country or a parish or a board of directors without enough common culture that you can know each other's language and know each other's thoughts and focus on a project. It makes it difficult if there is no national mythology, if there are not uh, a certain amount of myths. What was that old um, Norwegian war song? 10,000 Swedes running through the weeds chased by five Norwegians. If you don't have these sort of songs as part of your national culture, then it's difficult to focus on a task. There's a price to be paid for diversity. You have to print more than one language in your leaflet. And then there are those differences and things that make us diverse that have nothing to do with our culture. People differ one from another even in the same nuclear family. Even twins can have different points of view and different valences, different experiences in the course of life. And so anonymous person, epistle side, fifth row back, you have had a relatively easy time in life. You were born between wars. You were born in a family that valued education. You were born in a peaceful time in your own nation. And life has been for you very, very easy. You have stepped from strength to strength. You moved from your childhood to your adolescence with nothing than more than the normal um, course of problems. You have moved into work. You have made the right choice of a life partner. Your children are ten fingers, ten toes, and work and are healthy and are functioning. And you cannot understand why your sister, gospel side towards the back, who has been raised in the same family is so sad and has such a sense of grievance and finds himself or herself on the underside of things so much. We are different and that difference is not something which is always explicable. And so the sun shines on some of us 
and the sun does not shine on others. And there is both the joyous and the tragic in the midst of life, and very occasionally things completely switch around and people change and transform. Jesus tells a parable about a sower, and that sower goes out to sow seed, and he casts his seed broadly over a piece of real estate. And that seed lands on different types of ground. It lands on rocks and never manages to make any root whatsoever. It lands on ground which has plenty of nourishment and moisture in it, but also contains any number of noxious weeds. And the competition with those weedy plants means that that seed never gets a chance to put out its stalk and its ear. It lands in shallow ground, ground which is good and nourishing and moist, but only half an inch deep. And as it takes root, the roots eventually run onto something stony and immovable. And when the sun comes out, there is no moisture at any depth for that plant to access, and the plant withers and dies. Finally, the seed lands on good ground, on good, deep loam and manages to put forth roots and grow and be nourished and grow tall and strong. Now on one hand, the message of the parable would be, the one message of the parable would be, Harim, you need to be good ground. And there is another message in the parable, I suppose, to, suppose to Aden, make sure that you do nothing to change roots ground. Make sure you do nothing to impede that word planting and taking root in there. There is a message in there, but there's also something in the parable about rejection of the word, which has to do very much with what Jesus is about in the time and the place that he is. Because in this gospel story, rejection is going to be part of the drama. And it is part of God's will, this mystery of salvation that the common people should hear him gladly and the high priest should reject him. That he should come into one village and find that he or the 72 that he has set out have been welcomed with joy and that in another, in another village that has not happened. And so with many of these parables of the kingdom and parables of Jesus, they have very much to do with the drama of what Jesus was doing in his day and are not merely there to tell Aidan that he's in and that Ruth that she's out in a contemporary context of our own. But I cannot explain why it is that in every church I have ever been to, there have been people who have moved into the congregation and they have heard a word of truth, not just from the vicar, but in that congregation they have heard the gospel preached and they have run with it like a runner with a baton. And that there are others who are just too divided, too tossed about, who have wanted to put their life in sync with the kingdom of God, but there is just so much trouble and so much competition and so many things that militate against it. I cannot always explain why it is that one man or woman rises up and why one man or woman doesn't. I cannot understand pastorally why it is that intelligent, capable people can be as cruel to each other within the context of the family as they frequently are. That they can do things to each other in the context of their marriages and in the context of the raising of their children that are simply, frankly, cruel. I do not understand that. And so the mystery of salvation, which works itself out there in the ministry of Jesus, that one says no and one says yes, and somehow this is in God's strange will to ultimately be able to say that he has saved the world himself without human partners, that some of that incomprehension extends into the ministry that I have seen across these 36 years with men and women. And so the message of this parable is one which asks us to analyze what sort of ground we are. Because subtly in there, there are things to be done 
in case you find yourself in any of those categories. It would not be the worst thing in the world if you were to say at the end of this service or at the end of a sermon or at the end of reading a book about the parable of the sower, if I were to say to myself, God, you know, Robert is fairly rocky ground. You know, God, I have a lot of competition. There are a lot of things in the world, things that I worry about all the time, rubbish. Things that I yearn for, want to seize, want to move towards, which in fact profit me nothing. And I am not at peace with my family. And I am not at peace with myself. And I am not at peace with the one who created and redeemed me. Because there are all of these weeds growing around me. Jesus says, let he who has ears Listen, listen, think. Where do you find yourself in which category? Yes, you pay lip service to it. Yes, you are an attender. Yes, you are there. But on an effective level, that ground is pretty shallow. Now, I suppose it may not disturb you. But I think that if it does disturb you, that that's the best news you'll have this week. And if men and women leave a church in which anyone has preached on this parable of the sower and has asked themselves in his or her heart, what sort of ground am I? That the message behind this parable, which is not simply to say, Andrew, that this is the way you are and you will be this way until the day you leave this life, but that you are where you are and you are in the midst of life. And you have both the intelligence and the concentration and the ability to say, this is the sort of ground I have become in the last 10 years. And I am not pleased with its harvest. And I am not pleased with its outcome. And I begin to question the trajectory that I am on. And then there is cause for rejoicing. Because we see in the course of life men and women who hear a word of truth and go with it. Who begin to change and transform in the midst of this life. Who hear that God loves them and don't take it just as an axiom, but who actually feel the dart of that love and feel the appreciation for that love well up within them and want to somehow pass that love on to the people in their family and the people they work with and the people they are married to. And you begin to see that unpolished little bit of silver begin to gleam again in the midst of life. There is good ground out there. Some of you are good ground. You are all potentially good ground. And part of the process is being poked, moved, tested, irritated, troubled, thinking about what type of ground you may, in your 20s, have become. We are the living. We are the ones with time on our hands. We are the ones listening and weighing things up in our hearts. We are the ones who can take a step differently on the next step we take, different from the step we have just taken. We are the ones who can look at our habit, our habit patterns, look at our ways of dealing with conflict, look at our ways of dealing with grief, look at our ways of dealing with frustration and say, it doesn't need to be that way. I am relatively young. I'm not 70 yet. I am relatively young. I'm only just 80. I am relatively young. There are things left that I can do. And the word in this parable, not for the word of the contemporaries of Jesus, for whom this may have been a somewhat different parable, but the word to Aidan and to Andrew and Patricia and Jane is that there is time. And where there is time and space and people and where there is a mind moving, there is the possibility that we could enrich that ground. My father, in his younger years, a massively powerful man, and he would rent what was called a rototiller. 
And he wouldn't rent one of those wussy rototillers with the tillers at the back that almost anyone could use. He would rent one of those massive rototillers with the rotors in the front that you needed to manhandle through the ground. And I remember him cultivating a bad patch of land. And I remember the size of the boulders that came tumbling out there as those front rotors tossed them to the side. And I remember what it was like when we added all the well-aged pig manure, and when we dug the furrows, and when we added some water, and when we cultivated that ground. And I remember the, the zucchini we grew that year. And I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, any ground can be improved. Would you bow your heads with me?